It is unusual to be invited to speak to one's enemies. But many of you are enemies in name only. And I appreciate that. Nevertheless, I was in town for the holiday, so I thought I would accept this invitation to address this hostile crowd. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm known by many names, and I like them all. You choose whichever one works for you. I'm called Satan, the Prince of Darkness, Beelzebub. To some, I am the devil. To others, I am an angel of light. I'm called the father of lies, the adversary, the great dragon, the prince of the power of the air. And I know you. Some of you I know very well. Why, we were having drinks just last night. We were visiting some of my favorite websites earlier. Hung out with some of you in the channel this summer. Good times. And I hooked up with a few of you on Tinder. Of course, I was there when you cheated on your taxes and your tests. Truth is, I really don't mind hanging around you people other than these weekend spiritual times. You really are my kind of folk. You just keep ignoring him during the week and we'll get along just fine. (laughs) That's what cracks me up about you Christians. He loves you, and he wants to bless you and teach you how to live, tell you how to have victory over me. He wants to lead you to peace and to joy, but you'd rather play with me. You prefer my music and my entertainment. You go to my websites You favor my relationship philosophies. You prefer my language, and you like to play with my toys. (laughs) He loves you, and he goes out of his way to save you. He allowed his own son to suffer humiliation and pain for you. And you embrace my destruction enthusiastically. (laughs) And I laugh. Allow me to say thank you for your generous support of my kingdom. I appreciate all the gifts that you give to me and to my enterprises. I absolutely love that you take his resources and you pour them and to drugs, and alcohol, and gambling, and porn. It's a beautiful thing, really. But the gift that means the most to me, the one that I treasure when you provide it to me, is your children. They want your time and your attention. Oh, but you're so busy, and you're so tired. Honey, I need to make this phone call. Got to catch up on my shows. Got to finish one more level of my video game. That's okay. You don't have time for them. I do. I'll hang out with your kids. Yeah. We'll hang out online. We'll hang out with your friends. (laughs) They just want your wisdom and your affection And you trade in all of your authority just to become a chauffeur driving them to soccer practice. That's okay. I'll share my thoughts with them. 
because they're eager to embrace my philosophy of life. Yeah, young lives are so easy to lead to destruction. So thank you. Thank you for your unwitting cooperation. It's very much appreciated. Yeah, he loves you like a father loves his children, and I loathe you, I despise you, I can't wait to see you and your family destroyed. But enough about me. Let's talk some more about your stupidity, shall we? I love it when you Christians talk about me. (laughs) You're so afraid of me. Ooh, Satan might attack me. You pray these ridiculous prayers to bind me from this place. Can I tell you something? Those prayers don't do any good when the person sitting next to you brings me as their guest. Yeah, you Christians. Talk about my power. My power. The power of a defeated general. The power of a condemned prisoner. Yeah, you moronic Christians have real power and you don't even know it. I still can't believe you put your spirit in them. Because his spirit lives in you, I can't even touch you. But the good news for me is I don't need to. Because you ignore the truth that will set you free and you devour my lies like dessert. You miss out on the power. You own his book. (laughs) And you say that you love it. It's so important to you. You buy them as gifts. You engrave your names on the front. You download them to your devices. You just forget to open it. I mean, in it, he tells you how to defeat me, how to live a happy and a blessed life. But you've got really important things to do. You have to catch up on Netflix, check in on Facebook, finish one more level of Candy Crush. And I win. (laughs) And not only does he write you a letter that you refuse to read, but he actually wants to talk to you. He wants to have a conversation with you. How incredible. You have no idea how incredible it is that you have unfettered access to the throne room and how beautiful it is that you ignore him like a jilted lover. Oh, I know you pray. You pray before you eat. And you pray when you're going to tuck the little ones in bed at night. And of course, you pray when you're here. Sort of. But the truth is, most of you would rather text your friends than talk to your master. And I win again. And let's not forget that whole power of the gospel thing. (laughs) How insane it is to entrust the message of life to imbeciles who are so easily distracted. (sighs) You have the good news that will liberate your friends from hell, and you've lost your voice. Of course, I will take credit for that. Because you're afraid of humiliation. You're afraid of rejection. You're afraid that someone's going to call you a fanatic. Can, Can I just tell you that I am so inspired by your timidity that the spinelessness of your silence makes me proud. You know your friend's eternal destiny and you watch them live and die and you never say a word and I win 
again. <laughs> and then there's that whole love thing. Most inconceivable reality in all of creation is that he would love you. Wasting his love on pathetic creatures like you. And he's given you the power to love one another. And you say that you do. Oh, we sing songs about it and you use it as slogans. And your master even said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So touching. Ha, Christians love each other? Are you kidding me? They listen to your slander and your gossip and your lies and your constant barrage of negativity and criticism and doomsday scenarios and the world sees your emptiness. And they watch as you treat one another with contempt and anger and unforgiveness. And the world sees your hypocrisy. And they know how you indulge yourselves while others are in need. They know that you lust after the same money and toys that they want. And the world sees your idolatry. And I win again. I win. Oh, I know. I don't win you. Your eternal destiny has already been settled and I can't do one thing to change that. And I know my fate as well. I know that I'm going to suffer for all eternity in hell. But I will tell you this. I am not going to suffer alone. I'm going to take as many of those creatures that he loves with me to enjoy the pain and misery forever. So do me a favor, my friends. Do me one small favor, if you don't mind. Don't change a thing. Stay just like you are. Don't change anything. <laughs> Amen. You see, Jesus invites each one of us to follow him, and most of us here would say that we're followers of Jesus Christ. But I'm not positive always that our actions inside of these walls and our words match our words and our actions outside of these walls. You see, the number one reason why most people will tell you that they don't want to come to church, they want to make excuses, but they'll tell you, is because church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. They say one thing and do something totally, totally opposite, as we were just reminded of. You see, the world, I believe, is, is, a, is a party just waiting to happen. And there's two major invitations and two major parties that are going on in this world. And I have a question, whose party do you want to attend? I see a party that's described in the book of Luke. And I want to read that for us. And as we look and see what God's word has to say, I hope it speaks to your heart. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him, him being Jesus, heard these things, he said to him, 
Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Would you please have me excused? And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please, please have me excused as well. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the cripple and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there's room. And the master said to his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste my banquet. You see, this is a a perfect picture of an invitation. Imagine just for a moment that the most popular person in your world, whoever that may be, is having a great banquet, and you got an invitation to go. All you have to do is accept that invitation. And like the people in this parable, however, we began making excuses. We began giving reasons why. Instead of just saying, no, I'm not coming to the banquet. They trumped up all sorts of excuses. One bought a piece of property. I I got a new house. I got to go check it out. Another, in modern day terms, I've got a new car. I I need to test drive it a little more. Another is, I got married and obviously I need to be at home taking care of my wife. Because in context here, for 12 months, if you were married, you were not compelled to go and fight on the battlefield. So you weren't requested to go out for a year. And they use that as an excuse. And each one of us began making excuses, as did these at the banquet, when we receive an invitation. Instead of just jumping up and down, getting our best outfit out, cannot wait to get to the party, cannot wait to be there, we just kind of blow it off. And we come up with excuses. You see, that's a picture of us, by the way. You see, there are two major parties that are going on in the world. Two hosts of two parties. You met the remnants of one that just left the building, and his name is Satan. Satan offers a party as well. And oh, let me tell you, Satan's party sounds really fun. He perfects his invitations. He appeals to every desire individually that we have. Matter of fact, he excludes any thought of anyone else. It's focused only on you and you alone. You are the number one person at Satan's party. He addresses every area of selfish desire that we may have, and he makes it look so appealing. Oh, matter of fact, you've worked so hard, you owe it to yourself to attend his party. After all, who will know? Who will mind? I'm not hurting anyone else, and it's only me, and I'm going. And by the way, if you were to happen to run into someone that you may know, that you sit in the pew with on Sunday, surely to goodness, you're not going to tell on them. Because you were at Satan's party, fulfilling your desires. And you see, Satan makes it sound so wonderful. He is constantly, Satan is constantly selling his party. He's inviting each of us to his party. 
And his party tried to help us escape the reality of our day-to-day life and encourage us, each one of the participants in the party, to be involved in activities that usually lead to a lot of pain and a lot of destruction in our personal lives. Why? Because it's focused on our selfish needs and desires. And while they seem to offer a lifetime of fulfillment, mm, they lead to a life filled with regret and pain and sometimes an absolute slow, agonizing death. But then there's another invitation that we receive, and that's God's party. That's God's party. You see, God offers a simple invitation to his party. Did you notice in the parable, the master sent out an invitation to those he wanted to come? Some of you sitting in this room have been offered an invitation time and time and time again. And some of us have come up with some of the same excuses as to why we were not willing to attend God's party. Some of us may think we need to get ourselves cleaned up first before we can go to his party. Some of us are sitting here and having to decide whether we actually believe that this invitation called the Bible that he gives us is really God's invitation and God's word. And then if we make that choice to believe that the invitation is authentic and real that he offers us, we have to make a determination within ourselves, is this Jesus Christ, that this book called the Holy Bible talks about, is he really God? Is he really the Savior of the universe? Does he really offer me an invitation to complete salvation? Well, according to John 14, he tells us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go there and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back to you that where I am, you may be also. Wow, what an invitation! What an invitation! And God loved us so much that God demonstrated his love that while every single one of us that he sent an invitation to were still sinners, he still invited us to enjoy the salvation that he offers and it's only offered through acceptance of his son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. For God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. To as many as call on the name of the Son of God, to them gave he the right to become heirs. God invites us to accept his invitation of salvation. And he asked us to confess with our mouth, not make excuses, simply accept the simple invitation to accept that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he will do what he said he will do in our lives. And we get to confess it. You see, God so loved us that he simply invites us to attend 
his party that ultimately leads to eternity of no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. That's a pretty cool invitation, I'll be perfectly honest. And he also offers us eternal life and an abundant life. So my question to you today, whose party are you going to attend? You see, Satan's parties are filled with regrets. As your pastor is one of your pastors, I will warn you, Satan's parties will be filled with many regrets. The other side of that coin, God's parties are filled with lots of rejoicing. Lots of rejoicing. So your choice today to choose. Your choice today to accept the invitation that God offers to his party. Will you join me in prayer? So God, you've offered us an invitation to be part of your family. My prayer is that there not be a single person that walks out of this door that does not accept that invitation. My prayer is that through your Holy Spirit and as we sing this next worship song, God, your Holy Spirit would speak so clearly to the hearts of those that desire a permanent relationship with you. And we'll be sure and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship? Mm -hmm.